All right, welcome back to our next uh, background video. And this time we're going to talk a little bit about some background information to Iphigenia at Aulix, a play written by Euripides in 405 BCE. So before we get started with some of the new background, I wanted to make sure that we covered um, and quickly reviewed some of uh, what we learned last time uh, and from our reading of Agamemnon which is that Iphigenia, the daughter of Agamemnon, is sacrificed at the city of Aulis uh, to ensure that the winds would blow so that the ships that were stationed at Aulis would be able to sail across the Aegean Sea to get to Troy. Um, so something to remember is that the goddess Artemis was the one who told Agamemnon um, that he needed to sacrifice his daughter, and this was interpreted for him by the prophet Calchas, who was their Greek army's priest, essentially. Uh, and so Agamemnon, as we learn in the play, Agamemnon does go through with it. Now this play, uh, the Iphigenia at Aulis play, uh, is the story of how Iphigenia gets to Aulis, under what pretenses, and then what happens to her leading up to and directly after the sacrifice. So I just wanted to pull up this picture of um, the sacrifice of Iphigenia that we found on a wall in Pompeii and remind you that again there is this story where Iphigenia is substituted at the last minute for a deer and that she is taken up into the heavens by the gods. Uh, Euripides actually writes another play called Iphigenia at Tauris instead of Iphigenia at Aulis which speculates that when Iphigenia is taken up um, by the gods, she was actually transported to another city called Taurus and is later discovered by her brother there. So um, just another way to think about uh, the story and what happens to her, but uh, we need to move forward and talk uh, very briefly, just as a reminder about who some of our main players are. So don't forget about um, Agamemnon, uh, the, who is married to Clytemnestra. Remember, he has three daughters. Um, okay, let me amend that. He doesn't have three daughters, but he has three children whose names we know for sure. Iphigenia, his oldest daughter, Electra, his second daughter, and Orestes, his son. And there's allusions to other children who might be at home. Uh, remember, his brother is Menelaus, who is married to Helen. Um, Helen is the princess who uh, goes to Troy with one of the Trojan princes named Paris. Um, so just a little bit of background information. Remember, that's still the main conflict we are dealing with when we start Iphigenia at Aulis, um, getting to Troy to actually start this war. Uh, and there's lots of um, recollections of what initially started the war. Okay, so a few things that we need to note about this play. Um, first of all, the, the theme of marriage is going to come up over and over again. Um, not only past marriages, as in the wedding of Peleus and Thetis, which we'll talk about momentarily, uh, and the current marriage of Iphigenia, or the proposed marriage of Iphigenia and Achilles, but also, we also have the conflict between Agamemnon and Clytemnestra, uh, which is going to cause some strain in their marriage, and also the marriage of um, Menelaus and Helen, and later Helen and Paris. So marriages past, present, and future uh, are kind of our guidelines or our, our beacons that we need to follow as we go through this play and help us, which will help us sort of understand um, how all of these relationships are, are coming together and falling apart in the course of the play. One marriage that's alluded to over and over again is the wedding of Peleus and Thetis. These are Achilles' parents. And just a brief note about this wedding. Thetis is a goddess. Uh, she is called a Nereid, um, the daughter of Nereus, who's one of the gods of the sea. And there's a prophecy about Thetis that whoever uh, she sleeps with, whichever god or, or man she sleeps with, the child that she bears will become more powerful than its father. And Zeus, who was originally thinking about um, sleeping with Thetis, decides that it would be better to marry her off to a mortal instead to ensure that the child becomes more powerful than a mortal father instead of a divine father. So Zeus marries um, Thetis to Peleus, 
uh, who is just your run-of-the-mill guy who happens to be able to um, essentially wrestle Thetis to the ground and convince her to marry him. That's another story for another time. Uh, their wedding was considered one of the most famous and one of the most important weddings, and it was intended by all of the gods because a goddess was getting married. Now, Thetis and Peleus invited everyone except for the goddess of discord, which would make sense. You don't want the goddess of discord to show up at your wedding. But she was so upset with being excluded that she still shows up to the wedding, kind of crashes the party, and to really sow even more discord and conflict in the wedding, instead of upsetting Peleus and Thetis directly, she throws a golden apple with the words to the fairest or to the most beautiful inscribed on the apple and she tosses it into, into the wedding party. And this party includes all of the goddesses um, and all of the gods. And of course, many of the goddesses think that they are the most beautiful, they are the fairest. And so this is the background for the judgment of Paris, right? The goddesses who think that they are the most beautiful, Aphrodite, Athena, and Hera, um, appeal to Zeus to make this decision. And he's very smart. And he says, no way, I'm not making this decision. Let's pick some scrub human who is going to have to suffer the consequences. Uh, so that judgment of Paris relates back to this wedding between Peleus and Thetis. And again, we're getting deeper and deeper into the cause of the war. Now, the other reason why the marriage of Thetis and Peleus is so important is that it produces Achilles, who is one of our most famous Greek heroes, and many of you know him from the Iliad and other stories about the Trojan War. Um, one thing that's alluded to in Iphigenia at Aulis is Achilles' childhood. So even though um, Achilles' parents were married legally, he's essentially raised by his father only. His mother returns to the sea, and uh, Peleus sends him off to be educated uh, in a kind of boarding school way by a centaur named Chiron or Chiron. Uh, Chiron is famous for educating many of the heroes from ancient Greece, including Jason of Jason and the Argonauts. And um, his time with Achilles, we assume, is where he learns to refine um, his own sensibilities, but also to refine his physical gifts of being um, the most in, you know, impressive of the Greek warriors and certainly the fastest. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Greek marriage um, and marriage customs, because again, this is the pretext under which um, Agamemnon is able to bring Clytemnestra and Iphigenia to Aulis. Uh, he, he says that he's going to marry um, Iphigenia to Achilles. Uh, but in the course of the conversation between Clytemnestra and Agamemnon, um, and the conversation with uh, Clytemnestra and Achilles, we understand that there are certain marriage customs um, that were important uh, and that the Greeks wanted to be sure to uphold. So just a, a few things that I want to highlight here. Um, marriages in ancient Greece were always arranged by the parents, um, most specifically the, the fathers of the bride and the groom. Um, now, while we have you know, lots of evidence of arranged marriages going poorly. Uh, we also have evidence of arranged marriages going well, you know, that people who might not necessarily choose their spouses uh, do, you know, eventually um, build up healthy relationships with them. So this was not unusual. When a father was giving away his daughter, he was essentially promising to his son-in-law um, a dowry. So he was going to give goods and wealth of some kind to this son-in-law in addition to his daughter. He's promising his daughter's fertility, so the ability to bear children, um, and he's promising his daughter's skills, so her ability to weave, her ability to keep house, all of these things that she would have been raised to do within the house, his house, he's now transferring over to his son-in-law. When, um, when the Greeks got married in the ancient world, the the bride was typically just at childbearing age. So in ancient Greece, that would have been somewhere between 14 and 16 years old. Um, there are sources that uh, make reference to a bride as young as seven um, and other sources that suggest that, you know, girls were getting married as old as 18 or 20, just depending on what their family situation was. The grooms were almost always around 30 years old. So there is a pretty significant difference between 
uh, in age between men and women that we would feel uh, would be pretty significant, but for the Greeks was pretty normal. Uh, the, the wedding itself was a three-day ceremony, and there were all kinds of different um, stages that marked the transition, from, for, especially for the bride, from girlhood to womanhood. Um, but the, the stage of the marriage ceremony that Clytemnestra makes reference to is the procession from the woman's or the bride's home to the groom's home, which really marks the end of the uh, marriage ceremony, or at least the beginning of the part where they get ready to uh, go to bed together. So what I've got for you here is a vase painting that has been sort of unrolled, if you will. So this image would have been on a vase in a curved form, but the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston has very helpfully for us unrolled it and flattened it out. So you can see in the in the purplish box there, what I've put is the image of the bride and the groom with the groom holding the bride's hand. And these two little winged uh, figures around her head are Erotes or Eros, uh, the god of love and lust, the son of Aphrodite. We think of the um, Latin name Cupid. Um, so these are little Cupids who are following her and um, basically blessing her. You can see that she's wearing a veil. Uh, so the veil, the, you know, the, the tradition of a veil started a very long time ago, and they're striding off towards his home. Now, another figure I want to pay attention to is the one right next to it, right next to the groom. And this is usually the mother of the bride who leads the procession carrying torches. So many, many times in Greek literature, when we're making reference to the wedding, um, there's often talk about torches or being torch bearers or torches as being sort of meta metonymically attached to weddings. Um, and that's because that was one of the most emblematic um, symbols of a wedding where it was the mother of the bride carrying torches. So when Clytemnestra makes reference to that, she's being very clear about what her role is as the mother of the bride and why it's so important. The mother of the groom typically waited at the groom's home and was there to welcome the bride in and usher them into their bedroom where they were supposed to consummate their, their marriage. And you can see the female figure to the right of those columns uh, would be the mother of the groom who is getting ready to, to welcome them in. So um, when Clytemnestra makes reference to, again, when she's making reference to what her role is, we have to remember that this was an important transitional moment for Iphigenia, moving from girlhood into womanhood, but also for Clytemnestra, because this is really fulfilling her role as a Greek wife. Um, she has given children, and now she's moving into the next phase of her life where she becomes someone's mother-in-law, and she has a married daughter and will soon be a grandmother. So this is another stage for her. Now, one other thing that comes up a couple of different times is the act of supplication. And this is something that's a little unusual for us. And um, while we, we are probably familiar with the word to supplicate, often to pray for something, um, in ancient Greece, it actually had some formal gestures that were associated with it. So in our play, we have a reference to um, Clytemnestra supplicating Achilles by kneeling down in front of him and grabbing his knees, and then later reaching up to grab his chin. And we have an image of Iphigenia supplicating her father by kneeling down and grabbing his knees. So this was actually a gesture that was um, described over and over and over again in ancient literature. Uh, the Iliad in particular makes reference to a couple of scenes of supplication, and then it's all over Greek tragedy. But we don't have many um, visual representations of it from ancient Greek art. But we do have a very famous and a very popular image from the 1800s of Jupiter and Thetis uh, by a French neoclassical painter. And so you can see um, uh, this representation of a woman, or it could be a woman or a man, and it's typically um, a woman or a man supplicating another man, someone who's powerful and who can make de de you know, decisions. They will kneel in front of them and grasp their knees and sometimes reach up to grab their chin as a way to draw attention to themselves. And this is a gesture you use when you are asking for a favor. Okay, so these are just a few things to keep in mind as you read Iphigenia at Aulis, and we'll get to those uh, when we talk about it in class. Come with questions.